just get my screen up here. Um, give me a second. How's that? Is that? Can everybody see that okay? Yep, looks good. Yeah, fine, fantastic. Great, well, I'm really um, happy to have this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you tonight. And I've been involved in the vegan movement for uh, 13 years. And I think to date, the vegan movement has largely focused on consumption, particularly what vegans eat. But clearly, I think if we want to reduce the environmental impact of our food system, we also need to focus on production. So I started looking at this more closely in 2018 when the IPCC came out with their special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels and the potential mitigation measures. And buried right in the middle of this massive report, I found this, a 29 to 70% saving in CO2 equivalent globally by shifting to plant-based diets. And to me, that sounds pretty significant. Um, around the same time, a comprehensive study from Oxford University confirmed these findings. They looked at almost 40,000 farms in 119 countries, covering 90% of everything we eat. And they found that moving from current diets to diets that exclude animal products reduces foods greenhouse gas emissions by up to 73% and reduces food's land use by 76%. A study published the year before that, 2017, went beyond just greenhouse gas emissions and also included land use, fossil fuel energy use, eutrophication potential, that's the potential for excessive nutrients to enter the water system and lead to aquatic dead zones, and acidification potential, which leads to decreased plant growth. So they compared plant-based foods with animal products across these five dimensions. And they found that milk, eggs, pork, poultry, and seafood had two to 25 times higher impacts than plant-based food. And ruminant meat had 20 to 100 times higher impacts than plant-based food. Interestingly, they also compared organic systems to conventional systems and found that organic systems require more land, cause more eutrophication, which makes sense because there's more minerals and nutrients in organic food, and emit similar greenhouse gases to conventional systems, and that grass-fed beef requires more land and emits more greenhouse gases than grain-fed beef. Some studies say that grass-fed beef emits up to four times higher emissions than grain-fed beef, simply because grass is harder for cows to digest than grain. And also grass-fed beef take longer to reach market weight, so there's longer time for them to produce methane, nitrous oxide, and so on. So while we're on the topic of grass-fed beef, I'd just like to bust a very enduring myth. And here is the myth that I hear a lot. Uh, that grass-fed ruminants are carbon neutral or almost carbon neutral as they help to sequester carbon in grassland soil, thereby compensating for any emissions created by the animals themselves. Well, experts in animal science, soil science, ecology and related fields studied this question for two years. They were experts from Aberdeen, our own Pete Smith was involved, Oxford, Cambridge in the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland and Australia. And they published a study called Grazed and Confused. And the conclusion of this study was the contribution of grazing ruminants to soil carbon sequestration is small, time limited, reversible, and substantially outweighed by the greenhouse gas emissions that they generate. But still people will often say, oh yes, but you know, Scottish beef is different. Scottish lamb is different. It's no different. If we look at our emissions per capita by food group in Scotland, which is the center there, we see that red meat tops the charts. And red meat, remember, is beef, lamb, and pork. Not far behind is milk, which isn't a surprise because 40 to 50% of our beef in this country actually 
comes from the dairy industry. So we were excited about all this scientific evidence and we felt we wanted to get this over to policymakers. So last spring, uh, Amanda and I hit the campaign trail. Here we are meeting with two MSPs who you might know. And during this meeting, one of these MSPs said to us, you know, if we shift to a plant-based diet, that's going to put 60% of Scottish farmers out of business. And we disagreed with them, of course, but I also think it stopped us in our tracks. Uh, and it also showed us exactly where we needed to go next. And so our group, Farmers for Stock-Free Farming, was born. Not just to prove that MSP wrong, but also we wanted to create a model uh, for a just transition for Scottish farmers so that no Scottish farmer needs to be less left behind or disadvantaged. And there's our three roads to stop free farming. But before we look at this model in detail, let's talk about why that MSP said we were going to put 60% of Scottish farmers out of business, because I think that's very interesting. So this is a picture of Scotland's agricultural land. You can see that 77% of Scotland's agricultural land is rough grazing or permanent pasture, which is deemed only suitable uh, for sheep and cattle. Only 9% of agricultural land in Scotland is cropland. But if we look more closely at that cropland, we see that half of it is being used for animal feed, used to produce animal feed. So these are all the farmers Peter Chapman is talking about, the ones who have rough grazing and the ones that grow crops for animals to eat. So our first road to stock free farming is growing crops for human consumption. So let's begin by talking about the cropland. Almost 50% of our cropland is used to grow animal feed. And right enough, when we look at vegetables, we actually grow more vegetables to feed livestock in Scotland than we do to feed humans, which I think is tragic. Case in point, uh, the farmer who live ne lives next door to us, last year he planted this amazing field of kale and we got really excited about it and thought, wow, he's growing crops for human consumption. And then he opened up all the gates and the sheep went in and ate the kale down to the ground. The same is true for cereals. More than 50% of cereals produced on Scottish farms goes to livestock. So despite this massive percentage of land and resources dedicated to livestock, it's still not enough. 64% of our cropland footprint for animal feed is actually found outside the UK. So this that we've just talked about isn't even half of it. 64% is found outside the UK. So clearly this is not sustainable, is it? As our population grows, we're gonna need more land for more animal products and it just cannot be done. Clearly, instead of doing this, we need to cut out the middlemen, which in this case is the livestock and do this. So last April, a study came out from Harvard University that showed us that this is perfectly possible. They found that using all current cropland, just the cropland in the UK to grow food for human consumption would provide more than the recommended calories, protein, and nutrients for our entire population. And actually DEFRA had already said this back in 2008. They'd said, we've got enough arable land to feed us all. And if we do this, obviously, we would increase our food security massively and also our food self-sufficiency. <clears throat> so I'm going to preempt a question that might come up later on. And that question is, yes, but what about our protein? Well, these are all Scottish plant protein crops. You know, the Rowett Institute has done a lot of research into plant proteins. Right in the middle, we have lupins, not just beautiful flowers, lupini, bins, lupini beans are very high in protein. Above that, we have buckwheat. Buckwheat is not wheat, it's actually gluten-free. It belongs to the dock family, so it's actually related to rhubarb and not weed and sorrel. Uh, fava beans and broad beans, well, fava beans are making a comeback. Uh, they're also called field beans, typically often fed to livestock, but Hodmodods, a company down south, have reintroduced fava beans in a big way. Also, I might mention down in England, Hodmodods are also growing lentils and quinoa and chickpeas. Hazelnuts are now being grown in Scotland. 
Saitan, saitan is made from wheat. Um, when you rinse away all the starch from wheat flour, what you're left is with the wheat gluten, which is very high in protein. And last but not least, hemp. <laughs> hemp is a miracle crop. It's very high in protein. We can use the seeds to make burgers, milk, of course, yogurt, cheese, protein powder, protein bars. Hemp used to be grown widely in Scotland from 1000 AD. AD. There's even records of hemp being grown in the Outer Hebrides on the Isle of Lewis, on the Isle of Isla. Um, but it's so much more than just food. It's also a climate change champ. Hemp sequesters four times as much CO2 as trees in its short 12 to 14 week growing cycle. We can also produce four times as much paper from hemp as we can from trees per acre. So it's a great way to save trees. We can make two kinds of biofuel from hemp. We can make a substitute for steel that's actually 10 times stronger than steel. Henry Ford, uh, the car manufacturer, actually built a car out of hemp and other plant fibers. Hempcrete is a substitute for concrete. Um, there's a company down in the borders too making insulation panels out of hemp straw. And most excitingly, five Aberdeenshire farmers are currently growing hemp. Very exciting. Um, and Dr. Wendy Russell from uh, the Rowett Institute says that hemp is the only truly carbon neutral plant. And she's doing a campaign called Hemp for 45, which means hemp is the way to get us to the Scottish government's climate change ambition of net zero by 1945. So these, uh, sorry, by 2045. So these are all our proteins. And then there's our fruits and veggies. I mean, we live in a very fertile area, lots of fruit and veg grown here. It's crazy that in the UK, we still import 90% of our fruit and veg. That's completely unnecessary because we live in a temperate climate and we've got tons of rain. I'll just mention a couple of people here, Stuarts of Tayside. They used to be a sheep and cattle farm. Uh, they switched to soft fruits and they're very successful. Castleton Fruit Farm down by Lawrence Kirk used to be a dairy, now growing soft fruit. Bridgefoot Organic Co-op, they're in Newmacker, I just discovered them. Uh, it appears that Rebecca has frozen for the moment. Um, so we'll just have a wee, just wait for her to come back online. Uh, if you did um, want to, that's... Yeah. okay, great. You're back online. Am I still there? <laughs> yes, yes, you just froze a minute. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Just make sure that's off. Okay, um, so that's our veggies. Bridgefoot Organic Co op on the phone last week. Everybody's looking for broad beans. Uh, contact Bridgefoot Organic. And then there's these guys, they are in Inch, Aberdeenshire. I don't know how many of you have heard of the artisan grower, uh, Michelle and Robert Sullivan. They are self-taught. They learn how to grow stuff from watching YouTube videos uh, and reading books. Robert told me on the phone that he actually used to have a mud phobia. And there he is, you know, trundling through the mud. Um, what they use to amend the soil there, because they are veganic again, no animal products, they amend the soil with lucerne, alfalfa, rock dust, which makes sense because minerals come from rocks, right, and seaweed. So I'm going to talk more about seaweed later on. Before lockdown, they were supplying 35 to 36 hotels uh, with their microgreens. Uh, edible flowers and vegetables. Now during lockdown, they're doing about 150 veg boxes a week. They'll go back to hotel and fewer veg boxes. Gosh, how many acres do you guys have out there? Do you know what he said? One. That's one acre. Amazing things. So for one acre, you can have all of that gorgeousness. All To, to graze, but it also needs another acre to dry that food, dry that grass, or make silage and save it for winter. So one, we can have half a dairy cow, or we can have two thirds of a beef cow, but we can't have both. 
Okay, so moving on from growing crops to human consumption, let's go back to our pie chart and say, okay, what about the farmers who cannot grow food, who do not have cropland, they have the rough grazing? Well, first of all, we found out, haven't we, that we don't need to use that grazing land to make food. We have enough land with our existing cropland. Can we expand that cropland section and make it bigger? Yes, I think we really can. As my granny used to say, there's no such word as can't. Um, and here we have the polycrub. The polycrub is one way that food can be grown almost anywhere. They were invented in Shetland uh, to resist storms and high winds. Uh, so there we have fruit and veg grown almost anywhere. Also, we have some very innovative growers who are growing in areas that are normally deemed suitable for livestock only. Uh, here we have Gina Bates in Sutherland. Her craft was uh, deemed only suitable for livestock and she is growing hazelnuts. 312 hardy hybrid hazelnut trees uh, planted this past February. In two to four years time, she hopes to have 12 kilos of nuts per tree. Next, she's gonna be planting sweet chestnut trees. But for the farmers who can't or won't or don't want to consider growing food, we have our second road to stock-free farming, and this is what we're proposing. Subsidizing farmers and crofters to farm carbon capture by returning all permanent grazing land to its climax vegetation. Climax vegetation means our indigenous vegetation that the land will eventually return to if we leave it alone. And in the UK, the climax vegetation is trees. So we're not even talking about actively planting trees here. We're just talking about leaving the land alone and letting it regenerate itself. And if we do that, this would remove the equivalent of a staggering 35 and a half years of current Scottish CO2 emissions. Wow, that's huge. That would be a huge win for climate change, obviously. Uh, and also for ecosystems and biodiversity and rewilding. And a reliable source of the Scottish government told me that the Scottish government is looking, is piloting schemes already to pay farmers to rewild their land. We have a lovely example on our website, uh, Robin Bell, also in Sutherland. You can tell by the look of his croft that it's real rough. Uh, he planted 32 acres of his croft with 22,000 native Scots pine, oak and birch. Uh, he went through the forestry grant scheme. Robin told me that his great, great, great grandfather cut down the trees, so he wanted to put them back. So moving on, um, that's our second road to stock tree farming, ecosystem restoration. Moving on to our third way, as well as growing crops for human consumption, ecosystem restoration, we'd also like to see the government supporting farmers to diversify beyond traditional agricultural activities. Because what we know about traditional livestock farming in these areas is it's an economic disaster. 85% um, of farm business income is from subsidy. And that's not just in these areas, that's across the board in Scotland, 85%. In these areas, sheep and beef farmers are making an average loss of 27,400 a year without support. That's huge. So let's take that money and put it into initiatives that actually do bring in money for farmers and at the same time boost rural economies and uh, create employment. And here we have some examples. What we know, first of all, is farmers that diversify beyond traditional activities have income around 20,000 a year, almost 20,000 a year higher than ones that don't. That's quite an incentive. So on here we have everything from green burial parks to storage to outdoor activity centers, Loch Ness Shores camping and caravanning in the top corner there, uh, basically save their whole community economically by starting that caravan site. Um, a study by NFU Mutual, the insurance company, tells us that 65% of farmers in England have already diversified to the tune of £740 million in income in just 2018 to 2019. So there's a lot of money and also Farm Advisory Service, NFU, are supporting diversification right now. 
on our website, we have 100 ways to farm stock free. I encourage you to browse it. There's loads of options there, things we can do uh, to help farmers transition. One that we're particularly excited about is three crofters on Sky who are starting a new but a very old initiative. They're reviving the island kelp industry. Uh, 200 to 250 years ago, the kelp industry employed 10,000 families in the Western Isles. Um, what these folks are doing is they're not harvesting wild kelp, they actually got uh, recycled fish tanks on eBay and cultivated the seed in these fish tanks. Then they're going to transfer it to the sea bottom. Uh, when the kelp's ready to harvest, they're going to dry it, not just on washing lines, but in polytunnels on their craft. Uh, kelp is a superfood. We're talking about iodine earlier, very rich in iodine. It also has the highest calcium in any natural food, 10 times more calcium than dairy milk, has many other uses. Kelp is also a climate change champ. It's not defined as a plant, it's defined as a tree because it does the same job underwater that trees do on the surface. It sequesters dissolved CO2 and stores it uh, as it grows as carbon. So it's a climate change champ. What these three crofters are doing is they're creating a replicable model for other coastal communities to adopt to boost coastal economies and create employment. So almost done. To summarize, our three roads to stock free farming, growing crops for human consumption, farming carbon capture through native tree and ecosystem restoration and starting a diversification enterprise. And Gina Bates actually wins the award here. All these pictures are on her craft. She's doing all three things. She's one of the people that Peter Chapman said would be out of business, by the way. Um, on the left, one of her hazelnut trees just planted in February is already in nut. That's a red filbert nut you're looking at already growing. Center picture, a large part of Gina's craft is just rewilded. She's got waterfalls, ancient trees. She's just letting nature do its thing. And on the right, Gina is also in construction. So what she's building there herself is a glamping pod. So she can rent that out, get tourists and make a little bit of money. This year, the Scottish government have pledged 40 million pounds to the Agricultural Transformation Programme, a programme to support farming's contribution to meeting Scotland's climate change ambitions. And so here we have a model for how this can be done. And if we do this, it would permit the government to connect up policy on climate change mitigation, agriculture, food security, rural economies, rewilding, biodiversity and public health. And we could have a beautiful, healthy, sustainable Scotland where no farm is left behind and no animal is exploited. We could have the Scotland that we want. Thanks for listening, folks. Oh, well, that was very inspiring. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Very well thought out. Um,